So we're doing chapter four. Chapter four is actually relatively shorter. I'm not sure why it's based on everything else. Right, if I was writing this as a textbook, I probably would put three and four together. Um, this like five and six kind of all play off of each other. <clears throat> but we're now we're talking about the three-dimensional structure of proteins. And just to do a quick review, remember every protein, there's a hierarchy to the protein structure. So we have primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. We've only talked about the first two so far. But every protein has what levels of protein structure? Primary, secondary, and tertiary. Not, and we'll find out the reason why. And those who already had me for chemistry, cancer, and neurochem, you know the reason why. But um, we'll find out the reason why. Not every protein will have quaternary, but they all have, if it's a protein, they have to have primary, secondary, and tertiary. And what was the primary? What is the primary structure of a protein? It's just the amino acid sequence. And what's the order? N terminus to C terminus. Okay. And the secondary structure, what is the secondary structure? 3D it is a 3D structure. It's a localized, so I'm going to put that right here. Local or localized 3D structure, what? Due to hydrogen bonding of the backbone. And what were some of the examples? Yes. Those are the two biggies. Alpha helices, beta sheets. There are also loops. There's the 310 helix. There's lots of different possibilities. But like if you just had a, I know that those two right there probably comprise more than 90%. Okay. <clears throat> and like I said, we hadn't covered tertiary quaternary yet. Oh, one, two. And so that's why. And beta sheet, beta pleated sheets, the same thing. I don't remember off this edition of the book because they call them beta pleated sheets. And technically, they may even say beta strand, just because the beta strand, is, we'll see in just a moment, is one little piece of the beta sheets. And the important thing here is the fact that we're only talking about these interactions that have to do with the peptide backbone. Now, that doesn't mean that the R group, as I explained in the last class, it doesn't have some interplay on the possibility of the different secondary structure, but it's not due to their actual interaction, like hydrogen bonding. It's due to the fact that they are just constrained due to size. Okay. <clears throat> so we talked about the Ramachandran angles. Remember the little blurb that I think is not, I didn't come up with it, but uh, the fact that they give special names to the Ramachandran angles that, or two of them I should say, the ones between the C alpha and the carbonyl or the acyl carbon is the psi, so I always remember the CC psi. So the one between the C alpha and the nitrogen, um, yes, C alpha and the nitrogen, that's correct, I said it right, um, is phi or B. Now the one between the carbonyl, the acyl carbon and the nitrogen doesn't have a name because it's not a Ramachandran angle because it's an amide plane, so it's also called the peptide plane, the peptide bond. Okay. And these beta sheets and alpha helices really just have to do with, I mean, we recognize their structure, but they are because of the fact that they're only limited. They have specific um, ranges of these phi and psi angle possibilities, and they can be plotted on what's called the Ramachandran plot. We talked a lot about alpha helices. You can review your notes on that one. I told you how to find out if it's right-handed versus left-handed. Remember, there's an overall dipole moment because all the carbonyl oxygens are pointing the same direction as all the nitrogens are pointing down with respect to that. Um, the R group kind of pointed out, kind of reminds me of a, out in a, in a way, um, like a Christmas tree. Okay. Talked about how proline could be a helix disruptor if it's in the middle because it's for a couple reasons. One is the fact primarily that it doesn't have free rotation. It's it, it's fixed. It, remember, it's the one that the R group that comes back to the actual peptide backbone. And two is that usually its alpha amino group has no extra hydrogen. When it's inside the protein, it has no extra hydrogen for true hydrogen bonding. Then other ways to break it is if you have strong electrostatic interactions close together. I shouldn't say break it, but to make it kink or turn in an alpha helix. 
or if it's due to really big bulky things, um, really in close proximity, then they're going to cause it to, to bend. Let me show you the other pictures. Right, we last left, last left off, it was with the beta sheets, I do believe. So there's our little 10 minute spiel. Actually, I'm going to move this over. You can see on the left, the reason why they say pleated, because it's not a flat plane. It really does kind of have this corrugated look to it, just based off of the nature of the actual um, peptide backbone. Ooh, this got off, that got off. I cannot make that straight, so I just apologize. All righty. So, there are two types of beta sheets. And, and it's not really even two distinct types because you can have a mixture. It's the way that they describe individual strands that are adjacent to each other, okay? So I say that because each one of these, these, got that, is a strand. So this, for example, would be a strand, and this is a strand. If the N to C terminus, remember there's a directionality for the strands are going the same direction, then they're called parallel. If they're going the opposite directions, like this one's N to C and that one's N to C, then they're called anti-parallel. Those are the two types. So, the way that this works, oh, and, and then what you can do is you can actually identify if it's parallel or anti-parallel without even trying to figure out which one's the N-terminus and C-terminus based off of the hydrogen binding patterns. This is where it kind of seems counterintuitive or people get it backwards. The parallel beta strands, beta strands are parallel with respect to each other. Their hydrogen bonding patterns kind of look like this crisscross, whatever you want to, the way that that looks. Whereas if it's parallel, uh, anti-parallel, they are completely orthogonal to the plane of the arrows. They're at 90 degrees. They're straight lines that are 90 degrees to the backbone itself. One other thing that is different, the alpha helix, all of those amino acids in the alpha helix have to be in continuous order. They have to be um, in consecutive order. They're next to each other, right? It's by definition. They don't have to be in the beta sheet. And I'll show you examples of what I mean by that. A lot of times beta sheets are drawn like this. And once again, Jane Richardson's one who came up with it. Let's say that this is the N terminus. Okay. Then we've got a loop. This is just an example. Don't hate me for my artistic ability. Then, lo and behold, I'm going to change colors just so that way it's really easy to follow along. Maybe it's an alpha helix. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's just a really big loop, but here we go. Whoops, that's supposed to be a straight line. That looks like an inebriated beta sheet. Okay, then we have, I'm going to just change colors once again. Maybe another big loop. Because remember, this is in three-dimensional structure. <clears throat> ah. I mean, you can draw them however you want. There's, there's not like a reason why. And then this is a C terminus. I just wanted to show you that. <clears throat> so, some papers may number the beta strands. Some of them will give them letters like A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Some will say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. But if we look at the order in three dimensional structure, for the, this is a beta sheet. Each one of the arrows would be a beta strand. If you notice, they do not go in order according to their primary structure. Because if they did, this would be the very first one. But depending on which end we start, it's one of these two. 
And so now we can actually put in the hydrogen bonding. And so if for the hydrogen bonding for the bottom two, those are, are those parallel? Here, let me number these. And they're always numbered or lettered according to the order they are in their primary sequence, which I know it doesn't, so this would be number one to two. I'm sorry, I'm trying to keep it color coordinated. Three, four, five. <clears throat> so number one, with respect to number two, is it parallel or anti-parallel? It's anti-parallel, so that means the hydrogen bonding would look like this. Number one with respect to number three, is it parallel or anti-parallel? It's parallel, so it's gonna look, you know, something more like this for the hydrogen bonding. Then we've got two and four, those parallel or anti-parallel? Those are parallel, so they're gonna be crisscross hydrogen bonding. And four and five, are those parallel or anti-parallel? And so they're gonna look like straight lines. <clears throat> So that's why this is a mix. It's not all parallel. It's not all anti-parallel. You can have individual strings. I'll say like one with respect to three or anti-parallel. I mean, I'm sorry, one with respect to three or parallel. So on and so forth. The one other thing I wanted to point out is that the R groups alternate. Like the if this was the first R group, when maybe above the plane of the sheet, the next one would be below the plane of the sheet. The next one would be above the plane, below the plane, above the plane, below the plane. And so that's what this over here. Oh, whoops, is attempting to show. See, this one's going below. Oh, I can't really tell. <laughs> below, above, below, above, below, above. Okay. Are there any questions on issues? We'll look at more examples of them. They can form really complex structures. So this one's a different one. This is called, this is a collagen triple helix. I forgot to check to see if that link still worked or not. So this is wordy. If I was, if I, if you gave me this talk right here, I'd probably deduct some points and say, you know, there's just too much text. I don't, don't like that. Okay, so what are the, like, you know, be more concise. I didn't write this, this one there. <laughs> So, if you just look at the name Collagen Triple Helix, how many strands do you suppose are going to be in it? Three. Three. And the overall structure would look <laughs> helical. This is not an alpha helix, so these, and I'll show you pictures. I think I'll put your pictures in here. Yeah. These are not like big, broad, alpha helical looking. These are really skinny. It almost looks like you took that slinky and you stretched it out. Like, you know, you had this really horrible friend. I don't know if they had metal slinkies, but then you got kids, and you just went in the little cheap plastic kind. Mm -hmm. You know, the metal ones that kind of looked like in the 70s, like when I was a kid, that were like barats, like you could kill somebody with them. Well, you know, and you had that one little slinky kid in the neighborhood that just took your slinky and then like stretched it to where you're no longer like up and down, because now it's like this. That's what this looks like. I'm not bitter. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, slinkies used to be like kind of sharp back then in the day. Our toys are delicious. They eat survival of the fittest. It really is. You know, if you survived back then, we had lead paint. We had, you know, all this in the diving board. You're gonna be what? Diving board. Yes. Yeah. So is that oh, yeah. You guys didn't have diving boards? Well, not for at um, only in city pools. Oh my goodness! Like that just that's so sad. Okay, <laughs> diving boards, we drove off of like rocks. <laughs> you don't need a board. <laughs> but, <laughs> all right. But no, so that's what it is. So the collagen triple helix, you have each helix is really skinny, like stretched out, and then there are three of them that are intertwined. So, and that's what makes up the collagen. And once again, collagen, what are, what's the whole purpose of collagen for your body? Just in general, broad general. What? It's a structural protein. It has great tensile strength. So you can think of it almost like a rope. In the moment when you see it, it does 
going to look like a world because of the fact that you have this individual helix, and then another helix is intertwined, and then a third helix is intertwined. And the way that they can get around that is about one third of all the amino acids in it is some type of protein, either a protein or that hydroxy protein that we talked about, chapter or whatever. There are also hydroxylysis. <clears throat> Now, the three strands are held together by the hydrogen bonding that can occur between these hydroxyprolines and hydroxylases. Right. But remember, proline makes it really kinky. On HYP, yeah, I did put up there. That is a, there are other amino acids. Some of them do have three other codes and one other codes and stuff like that. So that one's hydroxyproline. It's just not a naturally occurring one that's used for translation. It's usually post translational modification. So, but it does exist. Oh, okay. you can have a deficiency. It's called fragile collagen disease. And it causes like, it like people's skins to, to sag. So let that sag. They're like overripe tomatoes, things like that. It looks like they have slippery skin. <clears throat> okay. So this is what I'm showing. There are also lots and lots of glycine. Do you remember glycine? What's the R group on the glycine? is a hydrogen. And so they are ridiculously tiny for making sharp turns. So glycines, alanines, things like that. So if we look here, we can see, I can't tell the different colors apart, but in the gray, we've got one of the helices. Here's another helix, and there's the third helix right behind it. And there's so many, or there are so many prolines, hydroxyprolines, alanines, glycines. So that, may, that way they can become really, really tightly wound. Okay. And We'll talk more about collagen, I'm sure, later throughout this semester and or next semester. All right. So we've done primary structure and we've done secondary structure. Collagen is actually a really good example of one of the things we're getting ready to talk about in just a moment. <clears throat> so let's review. We've done primary. That was, whoops, that's not alpha. It should not be an alpha. It should be the amino acid sequence. No N terminus to C terminus. We had secondary, which was a localized structure due to backbone interactions, like the hydrogen bonding of the backbone. Now we've got tertiary and quaternary. So tertiary structure is now a three-dimensional, a global three-dimensional structure. So now we can take regions of the protein that were way far off in the primary sequence, or maybe even like an alpha helix from the N terminus and the alpha helix from the C terminus, but in overall three dimensions, they're close together. So now we can start to, bond the, to um, fold it in things in three dimensions. So it's a global structure. And this is where the R groups can play. They don't have to. They are not the sole determinant of the tertiary structure, but they are definitely a factor of the ter uh, tertiary structure. Okay? So it's a global. I like the term global. You know, I did put it on the next slide, but I like the term global. And of course, this is 3D, of course, structure. And the protein. So many times when we think about protein structure, this is what you're really considering. And we'll look at examples in just a moment. Remember, every protein has to have the first three. They have to have amino acids, they're not a protein. They've got to have some type of localized structure to backbone interactions. Otherwise, it could be, uh, well, the only exception is if something's called natively denatured, which is very few and far between and for only small peptides. And then finally, we have, they have to have some type of 3D structure globally, overall. But now we've got the quaternary structure. And quaternary is completely different. So what is a quaternary structure? And why is it that not all proteins have it? This is where you've got multiple polypeptides in the sense that multiple <coughs> protein strands, whatever, that are coming together to form these big complexes like dimers, trimers, tetramers. 
That's one. The other, the other time that we talk about this is also like if you have like proteins coming together to form a big complex with say like nucleic acids, especially DNA or RNA, especially RNA, um, where they form what they have quaternary interactions to where whatever the functional unit is has more than one subunit. But there are proteins that only have one subunit, so therefore they don't have a quaternary structure per se because that's just them. So one example we might have Hemoglobin is just one subunit. Whereas hemoglobin has, it's just like myoglobin, but it's four of them put together. So there are four subunits. And so when we talk about next chapter, they, we talk a lot about hemoglobin versus myoglobin. And we'll be going to a lot more of the quaternary structure and these kind of protein interactions. Okay? So this is the association or complex formation or you know, whatever, whatever way you want to do it, complex formation or association of multiple proteins. I think your book likes to say multiple polypeptides, because once again, the term polypeptide can literally just mean multiple amino acids in a row. And or nucleic acids. Zuma, know what's an example of a quaternary structure between nucleic acids and proteins? Ribosome. The ribosome. That's the that's a, that's a key textbook example because it, the RNA actually does the chemistry, not the protein. But yeah, there are multiple, lots of proteins and lots of RNAs that all come together to form this big super complex, and so that would be a quaternary interaction with nucleic acids. Other ones are even just like the polymerase with the binding, you know, binding sites. <clears throat> for DNA. Okay. All right. So, so here we go. In general, there are two broad classes for protein structures. I need to point this out in here a bunch of today because they use this term to log protein. <clears throat> I forgot. In general, and like I said, sometimes these are not mutually exclusive in the sense that you can have some a protein that's really, really huge, that on one end looks one way, the other end that looks the other way, like act the, the, the um, actin myosin formation for muscles. Like they have a globular head and really, really long um, filamentous bodies. Okay. So but they're they're fibrous and they're globular proteins. So if we think of a fibrous protein, what do you suppose it's going to look like based off of its name? Fibrous would be? Strand. Yeah, I was going to say fiber. Yeah, it looks like a strand, yeah. You think this is really, really, really long strands. They can be sheets. They don't have to be alpha helical. They can be a beta sheet that's just really long. A lot of your structural proteins tend to be fibrous proteins. They usually, and I'm sure there are, there are exceptions, I'm sure, they usually tend to be hydrophobic. So you can just think once again of your skin. You know, it's a good thing our skin is hydrophobic because that way when it rains we don't melt, contrary to what some people believe. <clears throat> they, it makes sense that they tend to be very, very strong, because just like with collagen, collagen is one example. Because you've got these three ropes all wound up, super wound up together, they're going to be very, very strong. You know, once again, I'm sure there are exceptions. Keratin, collagen. Oh, after today's lecture, if someone will send me an email, I'll try to upload the full PowerPoint. So that way the words are already put in. Well. Besides just having the worksheet. Okay. But you just email me because I'll forget. And it may not show up until sometime this weekend, but I'll try to put it on there. All right. So that was fibrous. What do you suppose a globular protein? What does it sound like? Someone says it. 
a glob. Okay. Globular or globular. I say, I say globular. But yeah, those tend to be spherical, roughly speaking. They're globby. They're blobby. They tend to, usually, there are exceptions, but they usually are more water soluble than the fibrous ones. They can have much more well, um, intri more intricate shapes, like a mixture of alpha helices and beta sheets and lots of different things like that. Almost always, and with, there, there's one major exception, and you should know the major ex class of exceptions, but, in my globe and hemoglobin are the, the book textbook examples, but here I'm gonna do this over here. So once again, don't hate my picture. Here's our globular protein. So on the inside, usually is it gonna be hydrophobic or hydrophilic? Hydrophobic. So I'm gonna make it this color. So this is and there, there are exceptions, once again. Or on the outside, there may be a little patch of hydrophobic, which is really almost always, if you see a hydrophobic patch, if it's a wild type protein, you know, if you're not some mutant, if you're healthy, I think, and it's got a hydrophobic patch on the outside, usually that means it's important for something. Like maybe it's helping to dock with another one, like between a quaternary structure where two hydrophobic patches come together. Maybe it's for recognition of something or other. But usually it's important. Why is it that you, for most proteins that are globular, that the hydrophobic is on the inside and hydrophobic is on the outside. Why is that true? Their environment, what environment are they living in? A water based environment, usually. So, what is the exception? What kinds of proteins will have a hydrophobic on the outside and hydrophilic on the inside, or at least be hydrophobic on the outside? It would be opposite. Transmembrane proteins. That's why you need to know the exception. So, once again, don't hate my. Hate, I was going to say, don't hate me because I'm beautiful. Don't hate me for that either. Um, but don't hate me because I'm such the artist. But this is my phospholipid membrane that you're going to see a lot of over the next couple semesters. And so, for it, it's hydrophobic since it's stuck in the membrane. And if any of it's on the outside, then it usually tends to be more hydrophilic on either the side, you know, or side of the solid side or the um, um, extracellular space side and things like that. They may have hydrophilic regions. And we'll talk a lot more about this. There's also going to be kind of a cap put on to hold it and anchor it in place. And we go into much greater detail in protein structure next chapter of thesis. <clears throat> So this way, it's really important to know the, the exception because it's very, very important biologically. Okay. This is just a little, it's a little pictures. You can see that, that one's in myoglobin. Does anyone know what is this? It's, it's not pointed out. It's in myoglobin right here. What is that? Well, what is it? What's that ring called? Heme. And there would be the iron. That's the heme. <clears throat> okay. Oh, here's some better pictures of collagen. I actually like this one much better because you can see the individual strands and how they all come together. If you flip that supramolecular, the quaternary structure, I can throw more, the quaternary structure where you're looking down the barrel of the gun, once again, please do not look down the barrel of the gun, but what you would find out is on the interior, are a lot of the, I can't remember, I think these are lysines and alanines. So I may be, I say, it may just be, I mean, the lysines and alanines, it may just be the lysines. But you can see the small amino acids like lysines and alanines are all on the inside of even a big supramolecular structure because of the fact that that way you can make those really sharp turns. Whereas the bigger, bulkier things are going to be on the outside of the collagen. And so you can see it's very specific. And I didn't write down. Okay, now, that being said, if only everything was black and white, right? Primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary, 
But especially when we get to the secondary to, to tertiary, I've already kind of mentioned this with beta sheets, how they don't have to be right next to each other in the primary structure because it has this localized sensitive structure. <clears throat> There's this gray zone, okay? I, you should know the definition of the primary, secondary, and tertiary, and quaternary. But we get to this super secondary structure, okay? Sometimes people also call them motifs um, or folds. That's another thing. Oh, yeah, I changed that. Okay, or these super secondary, to where the, the, the simplest is called the beta alpha beta. And does anyone want to hypothesize why it's called the beta alpha beta loop? Interchanges between the two structures. No, even more simple than that. <laughs> this is the N terminus. What is this right here? Beta strand, so it's beta. Alpha looping over and a beta. Beta, alpha, beta. One other thing I forgot to point out when for beta, street, uh, beta sheets is they are not perfectly flat. There is a pitch, like a slight torque to them. Please tell me again. Consuela, go to sleep. Sleep. Technically, that was Consuela. Technically, that one was Consuela. But as long as Consuelo watches Consuelo, but if you speak Spanish, it makes more sense. But no, okay. All right, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a pitch, there's a turn to a twist. Actually, a twist. And so another super secondary structure, borderline slash tertiary structure, depending on how big it gets, is called a beta barrel. It's only beta strands, but since there's a natural twist to it, you can see that it forms a barrel. It kind of looks like that reminds me of the um, Chinese finger. Can you see that thing you know? Yeah. So what are the purposes for those kind of structures? Well, what would be the what one possible purpose for those French yeah. These could be some type of transporter. These could also be a porin, depending yeah. on how big it is, to where it can go through the membrane of the cell, and then things can just go down into the hole. Um, yeah, there are lots of different possibilities. Or like you could really transport something to where, or we'll actually look at chaperone later, where they kind of look like this and they've got like lids. On it, so things go inside it and it traps it. Mm -hmm. Those strands, are those just uh, primary so sequence of amino acids? The little loops you got there? Yes, that's a loop mm -hmm. that connects one strand to the next strand. Okay, so now depending on the environment of the foot approaching back, is going to depend on what those amino acids are going to be. Right, it can. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but some, something else that I thought you were just maybe yes, is depending upon the environment and the nature of these amino acids, sometimes these are flexible and move. Like they can wiggle, like they move. They can. They don't have to be, you know, just like we move. They, proteins can move too sometimes. Okay, but there are lots of different folds. You could also have, we already talked about the beta alpha beta loop, be a part of something else. So that's an alpha beta barrel, which barrels can be for torrents and for transporters and things like that. And so they may talk about it, and it's called alpha beta barrel because if we turned it on its side, or that's almost as if the barrel's like this, or if we pop it up and put something like a barrel type of shape. But you can see within that, there are beta alpha beta loops. <laughs> We've had, you know, let's see. <clears throat> You can have things that are all alpha helical, from being really, really um, simple, like the DNA binding fungal, that one I don't really know a lot about, to those that are really much more complex, like serum out human, which we already talked about serum out human in the last class, so it's like the taxi cab. Um, glycosyl transferase, does anyone know what it's glycosyl transferase? Start memorizing your enzyme families and enzyme names. It'll help you throughout this semester and next semester. What do you suppose they do? What class of enzymes are glycosyl transferases? They transfer. And what are they transferring? And what does glycosyl mean? Sugars. So, yeah, that is involved. That class of enzymes is involved. Because typically, things that have similar structures many times will have similar functions. So, that way, they're called families. Um, yeah, super families if it's really big. Okay.
we doing on time? Oh, mm -hmm. we're doing great. These are all beta sheets, beta based. <clears throat> so, for example, this first one, this family, it's of the family that are called UDP and acetylglucosamine acyl transferases. So, these are acyl transferases. What do you suppose that they're doing? This is a good clue. Break it down. Because we we, this, is, this is a lot for next semester, and when we start not talking about the disease states and stuff, first of all, it's a really cool structure. Secondly, uh, what do you suppose, if we just break this down, what class of enzymes are these? They're transferases, means they transfer groups. What are they transferring here? Acyl. Okay. That's where we're like, what's an acyl? Think back to organic chemistry. What does acyl mean? What does an acyl look like? What's an acyl group? A it's a carbonyl. And I'm just going to call this R. So it means it transfers something that looks like this. Okay, and what you'll find out is it's transferring. It's an N-acetylglucosamine with a UDP on it. And it's transferring it through the N. The N is a low camp for acetyl group. But yep, so that's why. Some of them also have common names. Okay. And you have them be mixtures. These are alpha beta mixtures. Okay, so one thing I want to point out, Rossman fold. Is that one that says Rossman fold? I think I actually have a bigger oh, I don't. Whoops. Rossman folds. For those whenever you're doing your enzyme structures and your enzyme papers and stuff, anytime you see this Rossman. Usually, I mean, I can't think of any exceptions that indicates that it's going to bind NAD or NADP, which the only difference between that is if it's phosphorylated. Um, and, it's just, and they're almost always dehydrogenases. Like I said, I can't think of any exceptions off the top of my head. But see, it can be quite uh, complex. This is phosphofructokinase, which is one of my favorite enzymes to say. I'm going to find out next semester there are two isoforms. Phosphofructokinase 1 and phosphofructokinase 2. <laughs> okay. All right. So, what are some of the factors that, that drive? This is really important. So, yeah, the test will be over everything that's in. There's, we don't have a whole lot of slides left, but everything is up. <laughs> Think about it. Some of the ways that the protein can be held together in three dimensional space. One, I already gave you a really good. One of them is the formation of disulfide bonds between cysteines. And these do not have to be cysteines that are close together in the primary sequence, but they are in the tertiary or quaternary sequence. So what are some of the other non-covalent ones? This is a covalent interaction. What are some, just think about some of the properties that you can utilize. Hydrogen bonding. Van der Waals. Okay, which if you think about Van der Waals in particular, that was the Jin Kim way of saying, how do we? Induced dipole. Like, uh, it can be an induced dipole, and induced dipoles always occur with what kind of substances? Are they hydrophilic or hydrophobic? Hydrophobic. Like like we usually refer to that as hydrophobic. <laughs> Technically, any, I mean, literally, Van der Waals would just mean that they come in close contact. Usually, so hydrophobic. You can't have hydrophilic, which normally, instead of saying hydrophilic interactions, we normally say. Ionic. So that's one extreme case. Ionic. What's between like hydrogen bonding and ionic? So well, this is dipole or polar interaction. So and then polar and like polar um, So here we go. The fancy term for ionic is electrostatic. It's just that means ionic. <clears throat> Another way that some people forget is repulsion. <laughs> okay, electrostatic repulsion can also help affect the way the protein fold as well. <clears throat> 
And one that's not on there, which I need, I would try to add it. But it's on the picture, so I like this picture that's coming up. I'll show you. Our metals, and this is usually one that people forget, because you know we don't really get to cover inorganic chemistry too much in our classes. We do some actually in this class. Um, th first of all, these are secondary structures. But a metal, metal ion coordination, metals can hold things in place too. Zinc can be a really good one. Co um, copper, pan, cobalt, some of these others can too. But zinc is always such a detail. Back when I taught Jim Kim too, I used to have, I used to deliberately do the coordination chemistry chapter, even though a lot of times it's, just, it's one of the ones that's, you know, pitched because of the fact that that was the only time throughout all of our you know, four years we could see it. You had hydrophobic interactions. Um, we have the disulfide bond between two local cysteines. We have this hydrogen bonding, and then we also have the electrostatic bonds. And this is just to try to show you a little cartoony way of showing all that. Okay. So we talked about what of these, which I actually haven't said yet, which one, when the protein is first being born, the nascent protein, what is the driving force for protein structure? What is the number one thing of all of these? that will cause a protein to initially fold, hopefully start to adopt the correct fold. Hydrophobic. Hydrophobic interactions. Because if you think about it, it's being born, being birthed from the ribosome into an aqueous environment. So almost always, that first initial collapse is the hydrophobic parts will start to collapse in, okay, they want to exclude the water. And then you do all the fine tuning with the other stuff. <coughs> And once again, I'm sure there are exceptions, but it's not the name. That was folding. What's it called whenever proteins start to fall apart and unfold? Denaturation. So what we're going to last leave off for here, for right now, is just denaturation. And that literally just means you're starting to fall apart. You're losing your structure. Or you're, you're losing the correct structure, I should say. There are lots of ways to fall apart. One, for hydrophobic interactions, you add detergent. Okay. In fact, this is how your shampoo works, and this is how laundry detergent pretty much works, by the way, for getting stuff out. In fact, if you look back in your shampoo, don't be surprised if some of them will actually say SDS, but some will say SLS or sodium lauryl sulfate. Lauryl and the S will mean the same thing. It's just lauryl, so common name. <clears throat> you can change the pH. By changing the pH, you will eventually change the, um, due to the pKa's, you'll change the, the different ionic interactions of life. And you can also affect polar interactions too with that. Um, urea is one that you probably haven't done. Urea and guanidine, the short times of bonding. And then this one, there's, we call it BME, but it's technically beta with capital ethanol. But there's also one called DTT, dithiothreatol, which is related to it. And they both, they both, uh, Disrupt by salt bonds. Okay. All right. 